Hi, Romeo. Thanks for joining me, friend. Yeah, great to be here. Um, so maybe just to start, I'll ask you the question that I ask everyone, which is to sort of introduce yourself by sharing your background and your life story and anything you'd like to share about what's happened to you so far in your life. You can answer at great length if you'd like or in a very short way, sharing whatever you'd like. Yeah. Um, well, as sometimes happens, you know, I've grown kind of skeptical of my own story about my mm -hmm. life uh, in the last couple of years, but I can give, I can give some cached answers and see if anything. anything what is the skepticism? Uh, well, there's the, there's just the basic that it tends to be a, it tends towards a narcissistic or self-aggrandizing frame in some ways, mm. both in obvious ways, but also there's there's very subtle ways that as you tell and retell uh, the sort of set pieces about what you believe uh, was formative for you, mm -hmm. um, those memories warp and shift, and they're probably warping and shifting in a direction. It's not, it's not a completely random walk. They're probably warping and shifting in a direction. And mm. the felt sense of that warp becomes more apparent and i don't i can't always characterize what it is as i said maybe narcissism and self-aggrandizement are the most obvious dimensions of that warp but i think there's other dimensions too and um so it it feels a little bit icky sometimes because i'll give a cash answer for oh yeah this happened that happened this is what i think about it hmm. and some part of me knows like eh. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's that particular really to you or, or is that uh, the human condition writ large Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think it plays out differently for different people. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give an example uh, and it can launch into the more object level thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I became aware just last year that emotional neglect was actually a useful set of distinctions for things that influenced what happened to me uh, growing up. Mm. Uh, not having certain emotional experiences or not having certain levels of support or affection from parental figures. And it's, it's of the nature of things where, because it didn't happen, you don't know to look for it. So like it takes until, you know, it takes until I'm in my thirties to even notice, wait, oh, right. <laughs> There's this thing that other people had that once, once someone, you know, a professional lays it out in sort of a checklist form, you can be like, oh yeah, every single item on that checklist seems to apply. That's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Hmm. So yeah, but it gives it gives an interesting set of trailheads uh, for investigation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I can I can talk a little bit more about the actual object level. Um, I grew up underclass, uh, so not working class, but you know, like criminal class essentially. Um, although it was complicated, and uh, I grew up in a wealthy area as well, so there was a large a large delta between me and the other children. And this played out in various ways. It's funny now, um, you know, at the time I was very distressed and confused. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that partially, um, along with some health problems, led to a lot of suffering um, and, and not having good support networks for dealing with any of that, right? Either mental health or physical health, not really getting any support. So that led to a lot of suffering. And I was sort of tangentially connected to the rationalists and those sorts of people and was engaged in this sort of rational project of how do I deal with my suffering and going through sort of a list of interventions in order of increasing variance and severity. Uh, where you know the, the beginning of this list is like supplements and like optimizing sleep you know and the end of the list is like heavy opio opioid use uh, electroshock therapy suicide right like end, end of list right so it was like a, it was a full it was the full gamut of like i'm just need to keep doing things until something works because my current experience was a uh, was not acceptable to me at the time as a as a just quality of life uh 
so you know i went through the list and eventually i hit upon meditation and yoga and uh well psychedelics actually around the same slightly time, less right? severe than suicide <laughs> Well, yeah, in some ways, right? So mm -hmm. psychedelics can be, psychedelics and meditation can both be scary along that same dimension. Absolutely. Of am I altering myself in ways that I don't fully understand um, and in ways that I don't, wouldn't necessarily endorse on full reflection from some sort of magical third person view. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, those both went quite well and suffering has been reduced a lot. Uh, and in the last few years, I have spent a lot of time attempting to synthesize analytic, emotional, contemplative frameworks to continue my own you know, frontier of insight and help others. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And um, I wonder if you could speak to... Um, some of the sort of specific projects that you've done in the world. Like I know you worked at, you were, you still cur currently work at Meal Squares and then you were also, if I recall correctly, involved in founding of QRI, is that right? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Andres and Mike were uh, uh, working on QRI before I mm -hmm. showed up. Um, I helped them incorporate and get them nonprofit status and their first round of actual funding. Uh, so they you know, generously applied the label of co-founder to me, but I, I felt see. like a lot of the core ideas were there already. Although, so my research agenda for a time uh, was heavily overlapping with what they were working on. Uh, their research agenda has since moved on, the form of the organization has changed. So I stepped off of the board because they, they're in a much better position now. They're established, they have employees. Um, so my comparative advantage uh, dropped. And so I'm taking a step back to work on, work on my own stuff. Meal squares, yeah, meal squares was a more standard sort of path. Um, I was in school for uh, software development, but wasn't very excited about it. I, did, I didn't actually feel like I had a comparative advantage in software development because I didn't enjoy it the way others did. And so I didn't really want to be competing with people who are going to be doing this for fun on the weekends. Hmm. And I was looking around, thought maybe I would get into government work or something. And then, you know, I, I live in Silicon Valley, so... I had a lot of friends with startup memes and one of them wanted to start a company and it's like, sure, I'll give it a shot. I didn't really think it would go anywhere, um, but it did. And so now we have lots of subscribers and it pays the bills, mm -hmm. which gives me a lot of time to do contemplative practice, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, I noticed that in both of, in describing both of those things you spoke to, like have, wanting a comparative advantage and competing with people. Can you, can you say more about that? Yeah, it's not necessarily from a very contemplative or contemplative competitive personality inclination. It was more the influence of my understanding of economics where I wanted to be in a, I wanted less competition, actually. I wanted to find, so by finding a place of high comparative advantage, I felt I wouldn't have to compete so hard, right? If you go into something where you don't have much comparative advantage, uh, you know, trying to become a, a famous actor or something where there's not actually that much differentiation between people um, who are all trying to do it, um, then life is very hard, right? You're trying to eke out tiny advantages over other people. Um, just to get ahead and that seemed like a really bad uh, place to be uh, for as a way to live life so i wanted to find some combination of skills and that's that's what drew me to software development i thought that perhaps uh the combination of some of those skills plus econ plus geographic uh independence being willing to go anywhere in the world uh, willingness to do some certain certain sorts of boring tasks that other people found aversive. I had hoped to find some sort of job with a lot of slack, a lot of downtime, so that I could work on my own projects. Hmm. And um, you were kind of primarily doing research for meal squares and like helping to formulate their uh, recipe. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So I had one co-founder. Um, he had, he tried to handle business for a while and then eventually left. So it wound up becoming entirely me. Um, and then we got some employees uh, eventually after the first six months or so. 
Um, but yeah, I, it, it, it did arise out of a bunch of longevity research I had done. Hmm. Uh, so there was the nutrition component of longevity research of trying to understand how much variance in human lifespan is determined by healthy diet versus unhealthy diet. And how much effort does that imply that we should spend optimizing and thinking about that? How confident can we be in the error bars around uh, those determinations? Um, so, yeah. What did you find from that research? Uh, Broadly speaking. hard to know what to say about it. There's not that many things where we have very strong effect sizes. Some, most of them repeat things people already know, sort of uh, processed meats seem to be quite bad. You know, fruits and vegetables seem to be good, these sorts of things. Um, Yeah, so do you mean just the nutrition research or are the nutrition longevity, longevity yeah i mostly confirmed sort of what is typically recommended but it was good to confirm that for myself and also determine how large the effect sizes are and, and how confident we should be in them so for example exercise uh the return on on longevity to exercise seems to be four to seven x so for every minute spent exercising, you can expect, you know, four to seven minutes longer life. Um, and that goes all the way down to very small uh, amounts of exercise. They're like even, you know, a few minutes of exercise once a week is sh shows measurable effect sizes in mortality, which is kind of crazy. But um, yeah, make, makes some sense if the if being truly completely sedentary is quite, quite bad for you, um, which we suspect it is. Um, Yeah, I don't have that stuff loaded in my head, really, because it's, sure. it's just, uh, I did the bulk of the research many years ago, and I don't tend to think about it that much anymore. A lot of it's just sort of baked into my lifestyle habits. Hmm. So I think I, I basically do live in accordance with a lot of that research. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know that I could, hmm. I could run down, down a checklist or something, but it wouldn't <laughs> be that interesting. What, what are some of the habits that you live by now that you think were sort of uh, caused by that research? Like exercise, uh, exercise yeah. yeah yeah so so resistance training twice a week doing cardio at least twice a week uh, trying to hit some sort of total caloric output in terms of exercise which is met by about that much exercise as it turns out um so that was one of the interesting things to learn right is like how much exercise is there some sort of curve does the curve have any sharp uh turns in it um is what, what does that mean about uh, caloric output being matched by the exercise can i'm not sure I follow. uh so you know, more total minutes exercise and different intensities of exercise will result in different energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. It was found that your total exercise energy expenditure was fairly predictive of the health benefits of exercise. Uh, and then, you know, different types because, you know, the different types actually work different systems somewhat. Um, but uh, yeah, burning, burn, so there's, and then there's a curve of benefit. So the first the first few units of exercise causing the majority of the longevity benefits and then tapering off at some point, right? So, so it, was, it, it was the, the desire to know when do those benefits taper off. And it's, it's a curve, so it's smooth. So there's not like a, you know, a very, very bright line in the sand, but there was found to be somewhat of a, of a, of a what do I call it, tapering around the 1,000 to 1,500 calories per week expended, hmm. which corresponds to, you know, if you do two lifting sessions, two cardio sessions, um, you're right around there. So it's very convenient. Hmm. And so exercise is one of the habits. Are there any others that came from that? Yeah, research? just, you know, eating well, sleeping, uh, prioritizing sleep. Uh, so a, a large chunk of the way that I chose to live was a result of not being willing to be on other people's schedule. So that, you know, most people are, have to have to be on some sort of schedule. Um, and I had sleep problems as a child. So I had a very strong aversion to, to other people's schedules. So uh, 
that gave quite a bit of constraint on which types of careers and which types of activities I would want to pursue. So prioritizing sleep, uh, what are the big ones? Let's see, it's been a while since I thought about this as an ordered list. Uh, yoga. <laughs> Uh, things that decrease stress, yoga being one of the ones that shows very large effect sizes. Uh, avoiding stress in general. Uh, prioritizing connection with other people, especially people that share your values. Uh, getting sunlight. So this one, I I'm, I'm continue to be surprised that not everyone knows this, but it's, it's starting to become more common knowledge. It's, it's making the rounds mimetically. But uh, the very specific claim is, uh, yes, UV light increases your chance of getting skin cancer. However, it also decreases your chances of getting five other cancers, all of which are drastically less survivable than skin cancer. Skin cancer has like a 95% survival rate, especially when you catch it early. It's very, very survivable. Uh, internal cancers uh, do not have nearly the, that high of a survival rate. Um, and UV exposure is inversely correlated with a variety of cancers and, and other health problems as well. Hmm. Um, now, some people say, well, just take vitamin D. They've tested that hypothesis. It's the most obvious one to test. Uh, people who take supplemental vitamin D, uh, just like with many other supplements, do not seem to show all of the same health benefits. Hmm. Very interesting. And um, you mentioned that you had sort of a research agenda that was aligned with QRI when it was started. And then, you know, now you're kind of doing your own thing. Can you speak to kind of how you currently understand your research agenda on the contemplative side of things? Oh yeah, that's a complicated one. Okay. Uh, so part of the reason I got into Buddhism was because I wanted to understand suffering because I wanted to understand my own suffering. But my other motivation was, well, Buddhism makes a bunch of seemingly fairly radical claims about the world, including by some accounts that we are uh, extremely confused about what's actually going on, sort of grandly in the grand scheme, like metaphysically. And so uh, being interested in, in AI research, X risk, uh, that seemed like an important hypothesis to check. Are we just deeply confused about what the nature of experience actually is and what we're actually doing here on this, in this universe? Um, and if Buddhism or, or Buddhist uh, states of mind that are attained via practice uh, have anything to say about that useful now after uh you know seven years ish at this point uh on the suffering question uh does what it says on the tin a big suffering reduction metaphysically uh it's more like it's it's a helpful set of tools for dissolving metaphysical confusions mm. uh and doesn't have you know any any necessarily any positive uh things to say about positive like factual factual uh, distinctions to make about metaphysical questions of the world um but yeah i mean dissolving confusions is is quite helpful i i, I consider significant parts of it to be continuous with the rationalist project in that sense um which is a point of some debate among people sometimes but yeah my research agenda uh mostly focuses on intention uh, the overlap with Buddhism being that one of the claims that at least some schools make is that all conscious experience has intentional content. And this is an interesting claim because this in Western philosophy, this is debated about. Uh, there's some, some philosophies that hold this to be true, so others that don't. Uh, and from my understanding of AI research, the, the current AI milieu uh, actually involves this question um, for reasons I won't get into. It's kind of a rabbit hole. Uh, the short version is something like 
you can, as an intuition pump, you can imagine when they were first inventing, thinking about conceptualizing and then physically inventing computers, they might have thought, you can imagine that they might have thought to themselves. Uh, it seems like these computers could, in theory, be very powerful uh, because they, you know, automate all these sorts of interesting tasks that humans do. Um, but they they seem to be symmetrically uh, useful to both good and evil, right? Good and good and bad influences in the world. Um, is there anything we can do in how we design them to prevent uh, malicious use? And, you know, maybe, but that, from our perspective, that seems like maybe a bit of a confused frame. That like, how, how would you design a calculator so that you can guarantee that it's never used to calculate anything bad, right? And then similarly, we're, we're having a, a similar thing happen where now we're, so that was the hardware layer. Now you have the algorithmic layer, the software layer. And people are asking, well, this software, it's, it's growing more and more powerful. And is there anything we can do at the software layer to design the algorithms such that we ensure that those algorithms are never used for anything that is, you know, against human values. And my guess is that this is a similarly confused frame. That there is the hardware and the, and this comes from David Marr, who was the a famous uh, AI vision researcher, that there's the hardware layer, the algorithmic layer, and there's also the intentional layer, which is you know, or Daniel Dennett's intentional stance of understanding what is it that the system is trying to do. And my, the current thrust of my research is we haven't yet discovered information theory for intention. We don't understand what intentions are, how to quantify them, how to talk in some rigorous way about the difference between two different agents intentions or intentions. Uh, we have a little bit in the in the sense of uh, things like voting theorem, theorems about combine. How do you combine preferences between different agents? Um, but these have these sorts of theorems have well known problems with them that make them unsatisfactory uh, in many ways. And our political systems reflect the fact that there is no neat, elegant, side effect free uh, version of things like voting theorems. So my assertion is something like, no, you don't make the algorithms designed such that they can never hurt anyone. You try to figure out what intention is so that you can design a system that doesn't want to hurt anyone <laughs> mm. in a certain sense. And from a certain perspective, that sounds like a muddle to take, but my assertion is that it only sounds muddled because we haven't yet developed the, the rigorous grounding for that mm. sort of reasoning yet. Mm. Would you say that your current line of research is primarily involved with AI safety, or is that just uh, an implication of the research that you're doing? Well, it's it's working the problem from both sides, right? So sometimes I'm working on more rigorous AI stuff, and other times I'm in the contemplative stack hmm. trying to figure out. So for natural intelligence is what is intention. Mm -hmm. I see. Hmm. Um, why would it be the case that contemplative practice would be connected to AI safety? Oh, uh, on the assumption that current and future AI architectures are neuromorphic, that we are developing an intelligence that is either in directly inspired by, or in many cases, uh, physically modeling. Uh, known intelligent systems, namely the human brain. Hmm. I see. Interesting. Um, let's see. Can you describe, um, so I have a, a lot of questions about this, but I, I would like to maybe take it back to the, the simplest level. Can you say a little bit more just historically about your own practice and, you know, what what was involved in your practice. You're sort of like, yes, does what it says on the tin, reduce suffering, but can you go into more detail about what your practice history has been like? Well, there's the same issue, right? That I I, I will tend yes. to frame that in terms of <laughs> frames that I have now that are much stronger than the frames that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, I got into yoga initially uh, and was doing a little bit of meditation as a part of part of yoga. Did like a six month long course. Uh, I well, I, I very initially got into Shinzen Young stuff because it was very systematic, and a month of that was enough to get me some effects that were very interesting, very promising, had some insights. And because at the time on the analytics side of things, I was working on this idea of search strategies that compound, that if you discover better search strategies, then you can use that to discover even more good search strategies, that sort of thing. Um, and these, these sorts of functions that eat themselves. Um, the idea of strengthening insight machinery in the mind directly and then you have more insights uh became you know very uh, appealing and seemed like the obviously correct thing to do so i just moved in that direction started devoting a significant amount of time to it uh got you know various effects um that you know there's a rabbit hole of talking about all the different weird weird things that happen in meditation but you know various weird, th weird things happened um, eventually, there were some deeper shifts that were not just about what happened on the cushion, uh, that were, you know, the matched. I, I later discovered, um, after trying to figure out what had happened, matched some traditional descriptions. And then eventually, that matching up was strong enough that I felt comfortable uh, identifying as a Buddhist mm. with all of the, the normal caveats that come with identifying as a Buddhist. Mm. Um, because I felt like I had confirmed the core, the core claim about craving and suffering experientially. Well, that leads us to uh, a suite of questions that, uh, how to put it? I, 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 I consider you sort of uh, like you set up the karmic conditions where you would be asked these questions, which is uh, <laughs> in last month, uh, Zoe was asking about, Zoe Kersey was asking about finding a meditation coach. And you said, I'm quoting, I'm going to quote you here. Mm -hmm. I like asking triggering questions. What have you attained? And why do you think you have attained it? I, what are you purporting to teach? Who authorized you to teach? Have any of your students made substantial attainments by the standards of your tradition? So I'll, I'll just mirror those questions at you and you can answer them however you like. And uh, I, I'd just be curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, fair. Um... So no one has authorized me to teach. I do not consider myself a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually try to represent myself as a noble friend. Mm -hmm. um, I will talk with people about their practice um, and uh, suggest things might be interesting to try. But I like to emphasize that I have not gone through any teacher training. And I am, very, you know, seven years is like very early into this whole game in the grand scheme of things. So I do not personally have enough case history to feel, you know, ultra confident, you know, diagnosing anyone else or, um, you know, telling them with high certainty that they should do something that is against their own intuitions, um, which sometimes happens, right? Sometimes a teacher can tell you that you should really, really try something, even though it's against your own intuition. That's, in fact, that's one of the times that a teacher can be most valuable if your intuitions are telling you one thing and the teacher says, no, I think you should really stick with, with something. Um, cause otherwise, you know, your intuition can often, often help. And oftentimes it's just, uh, teachers are just telling you to trust your intuition more cause you, you don't yet, you don't yet trust it enough. And you want to project that authority and power into someone else because of trauma and conditioning. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm not a teacher. Um, has anyone made any attainments? Uh, so people have accidentally had some energetic experiences. <laughs> that I don't think are actually great for them to have had without, you know, it's like, it's like consent with psychedelics. Mm. It's like, well, past me decided to take this substance, but past me is not current me. So in what sense did I meaningfully consent to having this experience? Mm. And the contemplative practice can be very similar, right? It's like, well, the person consented to be here. It's like, well, <laughs> personhood is complicated. Consent is complicated. So um, if a person did not sign up, to have certain experiences and then they have them as a result of things you suggested, right? It's just like, well, do the best we can. Mm. Um, but yes, I don't, I don't know of uh, uh, anyone getting confirmed attainments off of anything that I've told them. There are things that are some suggestive in a few cases, uh, but I don't really know. 
Um, so yeah, that, that leads to the question of what, do you, what have you attained? Why do you think you've attained it? There's the whole question of the validity of models in general, models of awakening. Uh, I, I mostly follow the Theravadan four path model. There's lots of controversy about that. The secular Dharma, Dharma people, not secular, what is it called? Pragmatic Dharma people and differences of that between them and, and them and the, the actual traditions. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm glossing past it because I find a lot of it kind of like, yeah, they're rabbit holes, but they're they're kind of boring. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, public claims of attainments are also a topic that is complicated. Yes, Shinzen claims that they're usually usually not great. <laughs> for a variety of reasons. I actually don't remember the reasons off the top of my head. I thought he had pretty good reasons when he explained it, um, which means that they're often more between just you and a, and a teacher mm. for them to be able to give you practice advice. Ingram obviously falls on the side of, it is important for some people to stand up and say, attainments are a thing and attainments are possible and you can get them. And that also seems to have some, some truth to it. Uh, so yeah, my own personal experience, uh, there's a variety of things that happened, but the thing that was most indicative to me was uh, prior to certain insights, reading the texts was an exercise in interpreting poetic language, <laughs> like, you know, about an experience you haven't had. Similar to like if someone has done psychedelics and you haven't, and they're saying, oh, you know how in psychedelics, like every place is a place? And then you're like, what? what? And the other person who's done psychedelics is like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that means, but yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, it's, it, but yes. And you can feel around for different ones and different people have had different ones, right? Yes. So you, ego death, the emptiness, various experiences. Hmm. But, uh, but the experience was prior to certain insights, poetic, poetic language that like, oh yeah, maybe I can understand. And then afterwards, oh no, like it's very obvious what experience they're talking about hmm. um, because you've had the experience and it's like, okay, when they say tranquility, they're mapping it to this. And when they say this, they're mapping it to this. That all makes total sense. I wouldn't say it quite like this, but I can see exactly why they would say it like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so that happened uh, uh, with a couple things that, uh, yeah, mapped up to seemingly important insights that led to, you know, large decreases in suffering mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, you know, very noticeable from the outside. There was a big, big shift in my personality. My family and friends who know me for a long time were like, what happened? <laughs> uh -huh. Huh. Um, and psychometric tests, uh, you know, neuroticism um, is already no is known to be the thing that is shifted the most with meditation practice. Um, mine went from 60th to fifth percentile in the span of one year. Um, and then it stayed pretty low. It's actually crept back up since, since the lows. And I think that's partially, uh, there's been an allowing process that's been kicking in the last like year and a half of some of that was actually a little bit of suppression. And now I'm just chill with all of it. It's like, oh yeah, there's a neurotic pattern. That's interesting. Just watch it. Hmm. Hmm. But it's gone, it hasn't gone back up to 60th percentile. It went up to like, I don't know, 17th percentile or something like that mm -hmm. from like five or seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. It's, it's, it's sort of fascinating that you happen to have before and after psychometric tests. I think that's, that's, that's got to be somewhat unusual. I mean, I've, I've never taken a test like that. Uh, not, not that I've, in any case, but um, that's, I think that's kind of interesting. I, I, what would you, of, of course, you are not your friends and family, but what, what kinds of things did you hear from them about what they noticed in those shifts? Uh, much calmer, much happier. Um, you know, unhappy people don't spontaneously hum and sing and like, mm. you know, uh, sort of smile at people and laugh mm. nearly as much. Mm. Um, so, I mean, even if you look at photos of, you know, <laughs> from years ago and now, mm. there's, a, there's a very significant difference. Huh. Um, I'm, I'm kind of also reminded of a, a person who was very skeptical at a party once and they're like, so can you just like be happy right now? And <laughs> I started laughing, which was funny. Cause like, it was the, it was the snarl of like, like I'm confirming your hypothesis, but I'm laughing at the fact that that's not really how it works. Like huh. I'm not, I don't perceive myself as being in control of my emotional state. Huh. It's more like I'm okay with my emotional state and because of that lack of resistance, well-being wells up. 
more mm -hmm. spontaneously and easily. But yes, from the from the external view, you asked if I could be happy, and I became notice noticeably happy uh -huh, immediately. Uh -huh. So yeah. Huh. Huh. Very interesting. And um, what does it currently mean to you to identify as a Buddhist? Uh, yeah, you've confirmed that tanha causes uh, dukkha, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, I might, might, I might change my mind in the future. <laughs> um, it's sort of like, I almost see the four path model as something like, have you grokked the four noble truths? And it's kind of like in order. So mm -hmm. first path you've grokked, first noble truth, there is suffering. <laughs> Second path you've grokked uh, uh, that Tanha is the, is the cause of suffering. Um, and presumably third and fourth path, similar. I, I can't make any claims about those, uh, but uh, what was I going to say about that? What was the question again? What do you, what does identifying as a Buddhist mean to you now? Yeah. So, so first path, um, stream entry, I was still confused about a lot of, quite a lot of things. And there was some, there was some clarity and there was some dropping of doubt. It didn't feel like total dropping of doubt. Um, so some would argue that that means that it's not actually stream entry. Um, but, uh, Before the time of the Buddha, stream entry was, you know, it's sometimes called classical enlightenment because lots of yogis will hit stream entry. Um, assume if we assume in in the model where everyone's hitting the same attainments, it's mm -hmm. you know this and that, that's another rabbit hole. But uh, in the with, and it's not a binary either. It's like there's a bunch of gray zone. But anyway. <laughs> uh, People who've attained classical enlightenment don't automatically become Buddhists, right? Yogis have all sorts of different systems. And in, in, even in other, other systems, it seems that just, you know, you look, you look kind of, kind of askance at, uh, you know, rabbis and contemplative Christians and Sufis within their own traditions. It seems like the things they're talking about at some point start to line up with the things talked about for stream entry. Um, so presumably many people in many traditions are reaching this point of this dissolution of personality view, I would say is like sort of the most important aspect of this. Uh, but that notably is not, um, again, what I would consider the core claim, which is the second noble truth, right? Tanha is the cause of dukkha or it's sufficient for dukkha or there's some sort of logical causal connection between the two of them. And confirming that for yourself experientially. It's like, well, I'm not taking it on faith, these various weird things that are said in, in various suttas. I'm just noting that, oh yeah, when I observe in my own system, this is the way it seems to be set up. If I, if I stack trace dukkha, yeah, there it is, it's right there. Mm. <laughs> What did uh, stack tracing dukkha involve? Like what were the observational practices that you did that helped you verify those claims? Yeah, okay, so noting, first of all, as Ingram says, you sharpen up the, it's something like the sampling rate. So if you increase the sampling rate, I don't think that necessarily a particular sampling threshold is totally necessary. It's very helpful. You're like, you're much more likely to sort of catch the moment if your sampling rate is higher. Um, and then noting, uh, I don't have a good metaphor for what it's doing besides up in the sampling rate, because it's doing a thing besides up in the sampling rate. It's, it's, there's this unblending that allows you to actually sort of watch the experience as it's happening. Um, and then other practices like note gone or, uh, do nothing meditation. I'm, I'm using, I'm using Shinzen's terminology, but we could talk about other, other practices as well. I did yogic practices as well. But they, many of them to me in retrospect seem aimed at, so you can increase the sample rate, but then you can also shift the sampling window. So note gone is the most obvious one, right? Where is if, if the CNS is normally habituated to attending to arisings and sustaining CNS? a central nervous system, it, it habitually attends to the arising of new stimuli and the uh, uh, sustaining quality of those stimuli. And then sort of ignores uh, the dropping away of those stimuli in favor of uh, the dropping away is just 
theorizing of some new thing, right? So then it shifts its attention to the, the new thing. And so things like note gone seem like an attempt to shift that sampling window so that we can sort of be catching a different part of the wave of activations. And, you know, they, they say, you know, enlightenment is a, is an accident and you're making yourself accident prone. It's like, well, you're sort of jiggling the, the sampling window around so that you can eventually catch the seams between the individual movements of the mind as it attends the sensory stimuli and then constructs a bunch of stuff out of them. Hmm. And there's, there's a bunch of individual steps, you know, 12, 12 links of <laughs> dependent origination. And it's catching a seam that seems to, it's sort of like if you're running your finger across a smooth tapestry and you suddenly feel a seam, like, well, well it's sensorily apparent that there's something there. And then once the mind realizes it's something there, it can sort of lock on. And there is the sense of sort of falling into the gap between uh, uh, individual mental moments. And in those moments, um, yeah, insight, insight can arise. Uh, so my particular experience with Tanha was um, on a retreat and I had woken up um, in the middle of the night. And so there's nothing to do but lay there and meditate. And so I was just attending to, I was having some sort of pleasant fantasy that was a continue, it was some of the content from the dream or something. Uh, so I was attending to a, some sort of pleasant fantasy of some utopian vision, some heavenly realm or something. And I was watching myself do this because I was on retreat. And so I was actually fairly, fairly concentrated. And so I was able to just watch myself attend to it. And let's see if I can describe properly. I noticed the mark of uh, Anatta in it, that I wasn't the one doing it. I didn't have control over the fact that I was attending to it. And it sort of did the weird inversion thing of no, when, I, when I noticed that. Um, the other three marks were like present too. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that was part of it was the, the inversion caused me to notice that it was actually unsatisfactory, even though it was uh, attending to a pleasant thing, that it was actually unsatisfactory. Oh, I'm, I'm attending to something that I don't currently have. It's separation from that which is desired. Um, and this was all rapid fire. I'm, I'm describing in retrospect with more a little bit more detail. But um, uh, the impermanence was already obvious just because that, that's the easiest thing to note um, when, you're, when you're noting. So I'd already been doing that. So it sort of all like came together and did the little weird weird inverting thing. And the sensation was something like um, I could see how, so the mental event would arise and the mind would coalesce around it. And the, the best way I can describe it is something like, imagine you take a, a, a apple and wrap it in a towel and like tie a knot around it. So that there's like a knot of towel around the apple. And then you're pulling on both ends of the towel and it's tightening the knot around the apple. Um, so if the apple is a mental event, the tightening is both just literal, the mind that does this tightening thing around it. And also the tightening is sort of like making it more real. It's making it, it's like coalescing it harder. It's making it more stable. Um, and that's desired when the object is uh, something that could in theory bring you satisfaction. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that pulling, um, and it could be pushing too. Pulling is just the, the physical metaphor here. But that push-pull um, and that tightening um, was presumably the thing. Um, and yeah, as soon as I noticed I wasn't doing it, I wasn't choosing to do it. It was just arising and passing like everything else. Um, yeah. A lot of relief. The stand, you know, one of the normal things, right? Giggling like an idiot. I actually had to leave the, the sleeping area because I was uncontrollably giggling because it's one of those things of um, like, oh, right. Like it's a very simple thing you're looking for because no matter how many times this sort of thing happens with insights, the mind keeps casting its eyes to the horizon that you're looking for some special, magical, shiny, spiritual. And there's a whole stuff with poetic language in the suttas about this. Of you're looking for the golden road or, or palaces in the distance. And no, it's the mud at your feet, right? It's, it's, it's just sweeping the path uh, 
uh, sweeping being a very mundane activity. Um, but yes, the, the mental activities that are causing suffering are not special and magical. Um, they're happening right now in the stream of your present experience, right? It's like you're listening to the same song. Maybe you don't isolate the drum track because you haven't just trained up in like isolating the drum track. Like someone who's been doing music for a long time can just, you know, do that because they've sort of trained their attention to do that sort of thing. But that's just helpful, right? It's still the same music track. Mm -hmm. It's just attending to it in a slightly different way. Um, I think I think that captures the main the main thing. <laughs> mm -hmm, definitely. Yes, thank you for answering. Uh, it, it leaves me curious about, um, um, you, you said that the way that you think about Buddhism and identifying as a Buddhist is that you've verified that uh, suffering is caused by tanha. And I wonder what you make of the various metaphysical claims in Theravadan Buddhism about like heavenly realms and hell realms, or, you know, there are other claims as well about you know, various cities that you can get uh, powers from meditation practice and so on. Um, for, for you, is Buddhism primarily something phenomenological or what, what do you make of those sort of more metaphysical claims? Uh, so one, I'm agnostic about a bunch of the claims um, uh, in the grand, in sort of the grand sense. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, all I have is, as Shinzen would uh, say, uh, you know, all you have is access to your own experience. So, you know, you don't really have, you're, you don't occupy any kind of privileged epistemic position from which you could really make uh, a claim of the strength that many of these claims seem to be, that this is a real thing and it's happening in some way um, in the world, reality versus unreality, which, you know, again, these are the sorts of things that you deconstruct in the, in the practices, understanding, oh, real is a tag I'm applying to things to like, because I want them to be more true or something, or like, mm -hmm. I'm worried that they're not true. And this is like, once you, you know, deal with that emotional payload, it sort of starts to drop away. But uh, to address direct, more directly, um, I regard most of the claims as primarily phenomenological. Uh, things like being in heavenly and hell realms are things that can happen to you um, if you've had bad trips or good trips. Sort of metaphorically that, that even though you are on earth and alive, you are in a hellish experience or in a heavenly experience. Well, if all there is is experience, if that's all we have access to, right? What does it mean to say that, you know, you're really a human on earth? That's really what's happening, hmm. right? It, it's, it's privileging a particular frame because that is reassuring to us emotionally. I mean, uh, so, I mean, when I read the sutras, at least like on a kind of literal level, it's like, oh, you, you will die and then you do. Well, I don't know. The, the, the Buddha makes some very interesting thing claims about like what continues that I, I don't I don't fully understand there. My, my mind doesn't quite understand them. But but the, the case is made note like there, there are like at least if you read it literally, there are like realms that are heavenly realms right. or hell realms and you go there after you die or or the realm of the hungry ghosts or the other ones, the animal realms. Um, and, uh, yeah, some people definitely do interpret that sort of phenomenologically and like, oh yeah, if you're tripping or you're homeless or something, that's a hell realm. And then, you know, if you're a prince like the Buddha was, then that's a heavenly realm. And then all of those end in any case, but yeah, sorry, just to sort of like insert that into the conversation. I, I, uh, I read yeah. them sort of literally it, it, like you, you, you can read them literally at least I think. Uh, yeah. And that gets complicated because we have to talk about what you know what happens to you <laughs> after you die <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> these are all frames about experience about things that we encounter experience and many of them are, are totally reasonable right like we observe things happening and we uh you know build up causal models on the basis of that and we manage to not get hit by trucks uh so that like the one of the things i wanted to confirm in, in exploring buddhism was are we just totally confused, right? Is this experience radically different from what we assume it is? Um, and one of the conclusions I came to is like, well, it's at least causally reasonable, right? We, we behave in a way that's causally reasonable from within this frame. So you assume that getting hit by a truck would be bad because of everything that you've seen. <laughs> we don't actually know if it would be bad or not, right? We have no idea, like we can't make a, a completely firm claim about that it would be bad, you don't, you don't know. Um, but we can behave causally reasonably from within the frame that we inhabit. Um, and there's a sense in which that has to be enough for us because when we're in a different frame, then maybe we'll behave differently. We'll experience that. Um, 
do are, is physics non-local do mind states affect things happening in other places uh is this the actual substrate or is there some other substrate that we're secretly on um all of these kind of metaphysical questions uh, again i i would argue that contemplative practice puts us in a position to realize that we don't occupy an epistemic position where we can make firm claims about them. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, what would count as evidence that we're in a simulation, for instance? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you can think of some things and make some ideas, but ultimately those are still going to be contextually bound um, um, ideas. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue them, that they're interesting things to pursue, but um, they are uh, less fraught when we pursue them from a place of having processed our own emotional payload uh, about them and mm. it's usually a desire for stability mm, interesting to, to ensure that we'll be safe or that you know the world the world will be just in some way that's a that's an insidious one that things mm. will secretly turn out okay um and it you know wraps back to trauma and childhood stuff and conditioning and stuff but yeah it's fascinating huh i guess that is why i care because if there are if there are literal hell realms i absolutely do not want to go to the whole realm and you know to some extent the bodhisattva vows uh are in conflict with that because i may have to take up the role of jizo and go to the hell realms and help beings but yeah uh so by the time that you need to do that um presumably if you've been doing things correctly you have enough equanimity that the hell realm doesn't bother you mm -hmm. hopefully <laughs> one would hope yes um so uh yeah i mean the the instruction is actually fairly simple because it's whatever realm you find yourself in, just keep preaching Dharma. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's actually very easy. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's one particular passage that I like a lot, which is um, <laughs> one of the bodhisattvas goes to hell and the demons begin attempting to torment them um, in various ways, you know, telling them various things, but also like trying to physically like tear at their flesh and various things. And uh, the bodhisattva just keeps seeing, he sees that the demons are suffering. And that that's what karmically is leading to them doing what they're doing and just keeps telling them dharma keeps keeps preaching dharma at them mm. and one of the one of the you know barons or like you know higher ranking demons <laughs> overhears <laughs> the bodhisattva doing this and he's like uh get this guy the fuck out of here he's gonna ruin everything <laughs> <laughs> what sutra is that in Do you know? i don't i don't have the side off the top of my head uh -huh. um, i uh -huh. could i could find it yeah i can uh -huh. try to find it yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, huh? Um, let's see. There was another question about this that I was sitting with. What? Um, uh, well, maybe it'll come back. But let let me go on to the next one, which is um, so. One of the things I, um, that you have written slash created is this diagram that I quite like and other people quite like, which is has sort of three circles, concentration, insight, and integration, and is sort of linking them and has little descriptions between the arrows and them and so on. And um, I wonder, so I have a couple of questions about this, but maybe to start, the, the simplest question is, um, this of course reminds me of the traditional three trainings, which are concentration, insight, and ethics. And I wonder, uh, is that third, how, yeah, how do you view the relationship between integration and ethics are those the same and that's just a modern way of speaking it or is integration a different thing how does this diagram relate to the three trainings yeah so similar to, similarly to shinzen mm -hmm. um you can you can sort of talk about inputs or outputs uh in terms of or, or processes you can yeah none this isn't a super clean ontology uh but there's various different slices you can take on the same structure and talking about concentration insight and wisdom in one sense is talking about outputs mm. and if you talk about directly the techniques then that's in some sense talking about inputs so i view integration as just talking about the inputs that lead to wisdom mm. so integration is the process by which so so what is wisdom versus intelligence right if and this is this is all going to be a bit simplified and hammy but if intelligence is your ability to solve uh, a particular problem. Uh, wisdom might be understanding the context of the problem, understanding which problems are worth solving, understanding your own motivation for trying to solve that particular problem, these sorts of things that help you contextualize. It's like, well, I can deploy my intelligence in lots of different ways. What 
is the best way, what way you know, helps myself and others. And so integration is a literal term for a process that includes more information uh, in, its, in its sort of all things considered uh, uh, envelope. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm saying this very well, um, but it's sort of like you can receive a file or you can receive a file with metadata that it, it involves what kind of file this is, how to interact with it, what APIs it has been used with, like what it's compatible with, why your friend sent it to you, what project it's a part of. Um, so this is just integrating more information into the file. So when we talk about wholesome and unwholesome states, again, this is literal. It's usually taken by people as being some sort of moral claim about the status of, of actions or things, um, but it's just literal. It's wholesome things are things that take more of the whole into account. And so because they take more of the whole into account, cause fewer side effects unforeseen side effects um, and therefore just lead to fewer complications in the future. And unwholesome things are things that are very narrow and, and localized and therefore potentially have sub significant severe externalities and will cause you to need to take compensatory action in the future or just suffer as a result of those unintended side effects. Hmm. Hmm. So what I'm hearing is uh, this is not this diagram is not the same as the three trainings. It's related to it, and these are specifically inputs that you can or activities that you can do to generate wisdom. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So activities that can generate concentration, activities that generate insight, activities mm -hmm. that generate wisdom um, is the the idea. And mm -hmm. then seeing the way they led into each other was um, uh, felt like it was my, my my first major like truly major. Dhamma grokking moment <laughs> of, oh yeah, it's, it all hangs together. It's not a bunch of random things, right? Like sort of like the yamas and niyamas in, in yoga or something or any other moral system where it's not just a bunch of random, seemingly randomly selected rules. They, they do hang together and reinforce, mutually reinforce each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that you can't, it, you will hit points in your practice where one practice stalls because you need to bring up uh, prerequisites or lagging issues with the other, the other mm. structures. What was your experience like seeing that for yourself? What, what was that experience? Uh, so I was in confusion after the first path stuff, as I, as I mentioned, um, mm. although maybe I didn't mention it in regards to me personally, maybe I made it more abstract, but, uh, but yes, I was confused <laughs> um, because seemingly a bunch of stuff made more sense, but still certain claims, I wasn't quite clear on exactly how they worked. And I was like, well, okay, but I'm supposed to like magically understand them. So something's going on. And in particular, one of the things was uh, dramatically heightened access to Jonic states. And so I was very confused about this. And then I went on retreat and is a different retreat from the one I mentioned previously. Um, I went on retreat and it was another instance of the pattern. Um, I had been, I'd been looking to the horizon, seeking out special jhanic sensations in the body and special, something special about one pointedness. And, you know, if you get access concentration and various, you know, you get flavors of things sometimes in, in a very few sits here and there, you can easily fall into the notion that, oh, that was the thing and I need to get back there. And then you you stop attending to what's actually happening in the body moment to moment. And then you can't be in, you know, present with cause and effect. And then you can't get to dissolution. You can't, none of the other things are sort of working because you're just not attending to how things actually are. Um, so I don't remember exactly how it happened. I somehow managed to drop that and was just attending to how things actually were in the body. And then at some point it just sort of started, you know, it's the thing that happens where it sort of starts going downhill and flowing into, into Jonic states. Um, and I was just like, oh, I've been, I've been, yeah, assuming that it's not just, just these sensations, just this, just that. Um, and so, you know, in the afterglow of Jonic states, you know, you, you sit in them for a while and they wear themselves out. Um, 
and something happens, it kicks you out of them eventually. In the afterglow of that, uh, insight's much easier. The mind's very clear, calm. There's equanimity. Various Johnny factors are present. Blah 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 blah. Um, and so, I was just. I think I was observing something like why I had been so confused. And it sort of just coalesced. It was very crystalline. It sort of arrived as like this. And I see why the, all the many facets of, 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 of it's like, yes, it's like crystals. It felt like someone had power washed some structure inside my mind. Mm -hmm. And now it was like, if you've ever seen like a video of like two glass shapes, like perfectly, perfectly, like smoothly gliding together. It was like, that was the sensation uh, uh, internally. Um, it was just like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then the way to verbalize it, you know, came, you know, after, afterwards, but the actual felt senses coalesced in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you were having, you, you, you were looking for specific jhanic sensations on the horizon, and then you realized at a certain point, oh, I have to attend to my body moment to moment, and then that's what actually took you into jhana, and then that created the conditions for insight to arise in which you were clear uh this is what i was confused about and that confusion was no longer there yeah and then the next the the next 24 48 hours there was like an integration cycle mm. of like oh well every everything's a bit different now so what does that really mean and then you know purifying those things in an integration way would lead to additional flashes of more jhanic states it was like oh bubbling up mm. then jhana naturally arises when mm -hmm. I when I clean things out, I just like I just see the way I was resisting, distorting, pushing on various things, um, and so it was just it's like this engine spinning up, just mm -hmm. like wow, okay, it's the thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of this confusion is just confusion. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that's it's it's a. I mean, I found the the three trainings to be a really helpful frame generally, but I love this diagram, and I think it's uh, very helpful for people. So thank you for making it. And um, yeah, I'd love to ask you. I, th there are some specific passages and the things that you've written about that I'd like to ask about, but maybe could you just say um, maybe very broadly? You know, I, I don't know. You've written maybe. Um, I don't know what 15 20 blog posts on your blog and then i know you write on twitter and facebook and stuff like that too C could you describe like broadly what how you would characterize what it is that you're trying to share about the dharma oh it's pretty random <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i just I, I like most people i get not manic but mm -hmm. i will have energy arise at various times i'll have like an insight or just be feeling good or have a con many times it's a conversation with one or several people in a row where the same confusion keeps coming up. And that's not just them. It's not just a coincidence that it happens to be. It's I happen to be in my own particular thing a little bit caught up on that particular thing. And so I'll be relating it to each of the people's questions in, in mm -hmm. a way. And so some part of the system is like, oh, yeah, you know, just like uh, just it activates the verbal parts of the mind. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh, yeah, I could like write a little thing. Um, several people asked about being confused about this thing. So I'll just like write up a little thing and it comes pretty easily. I don't do much editing. I'll edit as I go a little bit, but I just sort of blast it out and don't worry about it too much. Longer mm -hmm. pieces, I'll edit a little bit more because um, oftentimes I'll hit, I'll run into a snag while I'm, while I'm typing it of, oh, this actually has prerequisites or this is conceptually complicated or I need to find a metaphor or I need to find something. Um, but for the most part, I kind of just blast it out I because I, I, it's not mine, right? It just comes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, taking credit for it feels so gross. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what would I say about it? Uh, characterize what it... Yeah, I think the most common one is just if I receive the same question multiple times, I'll, I'll feel an urge like, oh, this is probably an issue for lots of people. And one of the issues is you know, you have an insight and then years pass and you forget what it was like to ever, you get insight amnesia, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. even like a, a week later, you've forgotten mm -hmm. what it's like to not use this as one of your ways of sense-making in reality. Um, so someone asks a question and it pings a part of your mind and you go, oh, right. Mm -hmm. I totally forgot that like you could view the world that way. And then you sort of want to like in that moment, since it'll fade again, when you're not talking to that person, um, you'll just move on with life and be in the, the normal 10,000 things, 
you say, why don't I take this, this opportunity to just write a couple paragraphs about this thing? And uh, yeah, people seem to like it. So I do more of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, opening the heart of compassion is a similar thing where, uh, you know, some books, it's like very systematically laid out and opening the heart of compassion, you read the passages and it's clear they're just jamming. Like it's just direct. They are, they are phenomenologically going into the realms and writing about what they see mm. in those moments. Mm. And that becomes obvious in retrospect as you gain familiarity with, with being in the realms yourself and seeing other people in them and going, oh, okay, right, this pattern, that pattern, I'm gonna, what, what can I, what energy can I bring to this that it will be a relief in this mm -hmm. moment or bring insight in this moment? Um, and then you just get used to wandering around the realms. Mm. Yeah, I hopefully we're because... staying in human realm in this uh, in this interaction. It's the the most beneficial. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I asked because I I mean I only read most of your posts just recently, but there was sort of a distinct flavor to them that I found very helpful. And I mean, you, I think you talked about this to some extent in either translating the Buddha or mistranslating the Buddha. There's two, two posts, and I forget which what's in which one, but um, sort of talking about, um, and it, it's been a little while since I've read it, but sort of a, uh, an impetus to put one's understanding of the Dharma into one's own words and for your own time. And, you know, like for earlier, you're talking about like, I, I mean, this happens, this has happened many times in this conversation and certainly in your writing, but you're like, oh, like, stack tracing dukkha or something like that that's a very contemporary metaphor and um one that might really resonate with a particular person that's actually done that kind of thing with programming or something and um i don't know i found a lot of the specific presentations very helpful i mean i think in general um i'm at a point i i think in retrospect and maybe this will frame some of the questions that come from here like uh in retrospect you know, as you said, like seven years isn't a long time to be practicing the Dharma and still very early. And uh, I don't know, I've been probably practicing, I don't know, maybe 11 years now or something like that. And in retrospect, I think a lot of that time was about concentration practice and what you described as integration and kind of, uh, and this took, this took far too long to realize. I wish I'd realized this earlier, but basically that um, was, there was just so much, there was a lot of suffering, but like, uh, yeah, that like trauma and emotional patterns were getting in the way of, uh, you know, my quality of life, but also having deeper insight. And I think um, it's felt like I have renewed interest in, in sort of insight end of practice because there's, there's some ability to concentrate and some freedom from various emotional patterns. And there, there are absolutely still psychological patterns in my mind, but I sort, I sort of know how to get out of them or not suffer less and that kind of thing. I have the, the tools to work with them far more than I did a decade ago. And so um, I think I think I sort of bounced off of insight practice for a long time, even if I was like nominally interested in it, because it was like, oh, my, my body mind really just was not ready for these kinds of deep shifts because there's just so much object level, emotional, psychological suffering, I think. Yeah. Um, so in any case th th that I'm at that sort of chapter of my own practice makes a lot of the metaphors as you present them and a lot of the teachings as you present them very like, you know, I mean, I've read the sutras quite a bit, but just very accessible and to my contemporary Western mind. So I, I really appreciate that quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think maybe one one place I'd love to dive into to start, there, as I said, there's some specific passages that I wanted to ask you about, but one of them I found extremely interesting. I'm going to quote you again here. You say, most practitioners are not starting with solid prerequisites about map territory distinctions, probabilistic over binary reasoning, and strong ability to demarcate is and ought positive and normative claims. I was like, well, yes, absolutely. I do not have these prerequisites. I, I sort of interpreted this and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but interpreted this as most practitioners are not um, sufficiently well-informed about rationalist norms and understandings or philosophy or approach. I, 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 I've, I've seen some of these things from the rationalist community. I might be over equating that, but um, in any case, can you say more about that sentence and what you mean there and how one might go about acquiring those prerequisites? 
Okay, so I don't necessarily mean rationalist concepts because okay. those are all borrowed in within rationalism. Those are all borrowed from uh, existing philosophical traditions. Map mm -hmm. comes from Korzybski, um, is ought you know Hume. Um, I don't even remember the other ones, but um, probabilistic over binary reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Bayes Be is a you know this is a this is old old hat. Okay, um, it's helpful. The idea that these are prerequisites, uh, I don't necessarily mean this in a strong way. It's more like these are distinctions that help uh dissolve very large realms of confusion so mm -hmm. you can spend there, there are territories that you can spend a long time in if you are confused in a particular way so a metaphor a helpful framing metaphor i found it's now it is unfortunate that the physical basis of this metaphor is no longer a thing <laughs> um in school before they had modern digital projectors they had analog projectors where there was a a, a a bright light and a lens and they would put a transparency on it and they would project the transparency up onto a screen and this projector with a transparent uh it'd be like a transparent piece of paper but with stuff printed on it right so it could project up onto the screen with a light behind it um i i think that this is a really wonderful metaphor because one of the things that is not as commonly seen but is used for some things like topography is you'll actually have multiple transparencies so you'll have the you know the uh the maybe the road names and then like the the elevation data as another transparency you lay on top and then like maybe some other type of labeling data or some other like coloring that re represents population density or something whatever the the person was was data the person was working with or presenting about um and that's a that's a wonderful metaphor for the mind mm. that the way you build up your picture of reality is you have multiple layers that are each contributing information um in the visual system, this is extremely literal, right? You you have edge detectors, color gradients, and and uh, uh, what is it? Um, light light dark, and then um, hue and uh, saturation and uh, and edges and and various other things that all get built up in, in individual layers. Um, and there's various neurological conditions that will cause one of the layers to go offline, and everything gets very strange. Um, but I would say the default situation is that some of the layers. Well, first of all, you don't know that there are layers. Um, and the layers are sort of stuck to each other. It's like you've stuck a pin between some of the layers so that they they move together. They don't move independently. And so you think that they're one layer because they're pinned together. I actually also like, uh, like, like imagine you've dumped molasses on it and the layers are all sticky. They're all stuck together. You can't uh, experientially pry them apart and see them as separate things. So an example positive and normative distinctions is ought or um, factual claims about the world and moral claims about the world. If you have not trained in making a distinction between those two, you will often get confused. Someone will make a factual claim and you're, you will assume that they're making a claim about the way the world should be, or someone will make a normative claim about what they think should be the case. And you'll, you'll think that they're making a claim about, well, this is the biological reality or some something. Um, and then this causes a lot of suffering, um, not just directly in that moment of you experience suffering of, of being of, of ignorance, um, but also then your interaction with the person is going to be very confused. Mm. Um, and you won't be able to figure out the ways in which your experiences have led you to having the beliefs that you do, and why you have the, the, the delta between your beliefs that you do. And since you understand the generators, um, dropping away a lot of the the animus the 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 what what is the, what is the word <laughs> the adversarial nature of uh of communication sometimes um so these distinctions are sort of prying apart the layers um probabilistic reasoning seeing that things uh a person can intellectually understand that things are not neither true nor false, but have shades of gray, but still have an emotional commitment to wanting certain things to be true or false. Mm -hmm. And if they're not able to observe that process and see, no, the actual underlying state of the world is, well, maybe not the actual underlying state of the world, but the state of, of my system or other people's system is uncertainty because we don't have the data to resolve uh, to high enough confidence that this is true or false, um, then all kinds of suffering happens uh, because they become you, you and it and it happens in layers again where uh, you get these weird spaghetti towers of uh, well I'm going to hold that this is true because I emotionally need it to be true um, 
and then on the basis of that i'm going to build up other structures in my life uh, because this is true and always will be true that means that it's safe to go do this thing um, and but it's not safe to go do that thing and so when you encounter evidence that it's not you suffer a lot or you freak out or you don't understand what's happening you get very confused because there were assumptions baked into your actions um i'm tempted to come up with some sort of example like you know you assume that your parents uh admonition to attend medical school is like based in fact and also because like that they love you a lot and that the various things right so like like me doing well in 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 it, because of this crazy stack me doing well in medical school becomes my parents love me in this weird symbolic internal rube goldberg machine right and then your behavior becomes more and more distorted mm. and you become more and more tight around certain things um maybe not the best example but uh i would encourage viewers to come up with their own examples from their own life mm. <laughs> because that's the that's the uh grist for the mill of insight mm. Mm -hmm. or at least integration if not always insight yeah i'm um so a couple of questions about this one uh, presumably the buddha and practitioners in the time of the buddha you know they, they they would not have been able to read the authors you named and yet presumably uh there was a similar skill that they were exercising or that some of them would be more or less skilled in what is what is uh kind of the most general way that you can state what this is that would apply to practitioners that like the Buddha that had never, uh, you know, read the particular authors or heard of these specific concepts, like, how can you state it extremely generally? Uh, so the causal stuff, the causal confusions, um, which many of these wind up being, uh, that's what the Buddhist version of karma and the mm. dependent origination are about, mm. is about understanding that everything is built of causation, and not of superstitious uh resonance between things because we humans have a we have a natural tendency towards uh animism and associational thinking mm. so we think that things have agency that don't we think that things like so well if if i want it to rain then i should like dress up as the rain god and like do a rain dance and then this makes it more likely to rain because of some sort of symmetry between me, myself and the environment and we use symmetry internally for a lot of compression and representation and so this is just a spandrel, right? It's 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 a it's a natural side effect. Again, going back to side effects of uh, that we have associational uh, reasoning for a reason. Um, it's highly useful in lots of situations, but it also leads us very substantially astray in many situations. So these these are more precise scalpels. Um, talking about is ought confusion, for example, it's kind of like the NLP meta model where. You can talk about, oh, yeah, there's psychological distortions, or you can get very precise of this type of language distortion in our experience tends to indicate this type of psychological distortion. Hmm. And that starts to be a much more precise tool of like, oh, I notice you always, you know, delete this from your speech, or you always say this as if it's a universal, or you always, right, you start getting more, more precise. And so these are just some precise statings of particular distortions. That because they're precise, they can be helpful for uh, finding the actual concrete situations in which they happen, and then uh, investigating that situation. Hopefully, having the insight, and then attempting to generalize mm. and think, "Oh, I wonder where else this is affecting me. I wonder if this is a sort of general underlying bias that the the system has towards." wishful thinking in this way or or whatever it is. Hmm. Hmm. And how would uh, you recommend that practitioners go about acquiring these prerequisites or practicing uh, <laughs> looking at causality closely? So I've been on a I've been on a whole thing lately about uh, so it's very popular right now to believe that we all have a sort of emotional neglect or that we're all ne neglecting emotional cultivation in some way. Mm. Um, and it's less common to believe we're neglecting analytic uh, cultivation. Mm. Mm. Um, it's like, well, mm. isn't society already like really oriented around it? Like, no, no, no. <laughs> mm. uh, society teaches you an abusive form of it um, ah. that causes you to actually have an aversion to it. And then you don't actually use it in your life. So like, when's the last time you sat down and tried to use you know, rigorous analytic techniques on a problem in your own life. 
probably not like maybe you do it in your job but then it's your job right and it's it's or you believe you're not very good at it compared to others right hmm. other people seem seem very impressive and then you go you well my comparative advantage is somewhere else uh so i'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna double down on something else and specialize in that instead um and so we produce these very strangely shaped humans who were, because the modern economy is highly specialized, you want to be a extremely specialized human, a very strangely shaped human, a human mm. that would not be, you would not encounter in a more, um, uh, a less complex society. Um, and this carries with it problems of neglect of, of various uh, ways of being. Um, so the way to practice these things, uh, I would say the most important loading process is find someone who you can work with one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis, ideally twice a week, where one session, in one session you focus on the other person, and one session you focus on you, and the other person is scaffolding uh, various techniques, and try out techniques that you discover. So this can be peer counseling techniques, this can be analytic exercises. This can be things that you pick up from uh, workbooks, like various creativity exercises from like creativity books. Um, you can even just like Google various things, right? Like creativity, uh, creativity techniques, or, or uh, uh, what's a good one? There's a analytic, like the super forecasting stuff, right? Super forecasters. There's a whole listing of, of techniques they use in the back of the book. Um, uh, John Cleese just put out his creativity book. There's the De Bono creativity stuff and the, the what is it, the, the artist's way. There's, there's also like in any given domain, there's lots of these sorts of things. And as you prioritize cultivation in this manner, if you, you, you know, devoting three hours a week, because teaching you actually get a lot out of, if you're the person holding space, hmm. you get a lot out of that too, because you learn how to hold space for another person is the same as learning to hold space for yourself. Hmm. Um, hmm. So it's, it's a double whammy. Um, so, you know, a, if you're spending three hours a week or 150 hours a, a year, um, that's going to add up very quickly to a bunch of skills mm. that uh, you'll at least pluck the low hanging fruit of, even if you only spend a few hours each on the different ones, so you spend any time at all on, on various things. Um, and they're just different, different ways of we encounter problems in our life, you know, most probably suffering, but suffering, you know, arises in 10,000 ways. Um, and you don't always just want to go straight to, well, it's all Tanha, so I'm just going to, maybe some of us will just pronounce and, and go straight to the mountain and, and work on Tanha. Um, but practically speaking, there's lots of fiddly ways that we'd also like to address it using emotional, analytic, creative, uh, intuitive techniques. Um, so setting aside the time to work work on that um and there's a bunch of emotional processing that like you, you want to front load the emotional processing that whatever whatever objections in your mind arise around being able to devote three hours a week to to cultivation um that's the that's the thing to to start with mm. is, right whatever it's just just like with meditation right it's like well you have an aversion to meditation okay sounds like you have a great trailhead for your practice mm. Mm. Is this something that you do? And if so, uh, what what kinds of things have you practiced with your partner? Uh, yeah, I, I've done it uh, with several people. Um, mm -hmm. So peer counseling is uh, the most common. Um, some, uh, uh, what would I call it? Methods-based philosophy of not, it's like practical philosophy, not, not just, um, you know, random, bullshitting you know college dorm level bullshitting of philosophy but of uh investigating various techniques and trying to figure out how is this technique built and what's it really getting at and what, what are like what's a concrete problem we can try applying it to and um and yeah i keep wanting to emphasize like this should not be a slog if this if this arri if this arises as a set of obligations to be a better person that's that's the whole thing is that there's so many underlying prerequisites to this sort of thing like it's just it's just prerequisites on prerequisites on prerequisites right it's um prerequisites is maybe not the right word because it implies that this is an intractable problem but you can start anywhere right and then the objections that you have will show up and then you can do uh aspirational inquiry on those objections right like core transformation core mm -hmm. transformation aspirational inquiry so that's one of the core skills 
right? Easy to remember, core transformation, one of the core skills. Um, because that allows you to uh, process the objections you have to do anything else that might be beneficial, trying, trying anything out that might be beneficial. Um, but if you can process that, uh, then you can just follow what seems to be interesting and fun, like deal with concrete problems in yourself and in your friends' lives. Hmm. Hmm. You mentioned core transformation just now, and I wanted to ask you about that. It seems like a, um, well, you know, right now there are a lot of these sort of uh, contemporary psychotherapeutic techniques, some of which you do with a coach, some of which you can do on your own as a sort of form of self-therapy. And um, you seem to sort of, uh, really resonate with core transformation in particular, and uh, maybe even privilege it over some of the other ones. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people, for example, are into IFS, and there's some others that have been pretty helpful for me, and I haven't practiced core transformation in particular. So I wondered if you could speak to what it is and what value found in it, and um, sort of what do you like about it as one of these techniques? Uh, yeah, so... I view it as a recapitulation of a Tibetan practice, hmm. Vajrayana. Uh, I don't know to what degree the author would agree with that, um, depending a on the level practice of- specific practice or Vajrayana as a whole? Uh, no, a specific practice, aspirational inquiry. It's, an, it's called aspirational inquiry in opening the heart of compassion. It's on page 120 or 125, hmm. I think 120. Um, and it's given in a, in a short form where it's just nine steps. Um, but if you look at it, it's, it's very clear it recapitulates the structure of core transformation. Um, so yeah, I mean, like if these things are reflecting true underlying psychological structures, then anyone can re rediscover them and it's not clear what the, the providence is, but, uh, it's a book length, um, although not super long book, um, and it's a workbook, uh, version of an expansion on those uh, those nine steps so it's a very accessible and you it's not even the full book you can it i think by page 50 something it has gone through the core algorithm and then outlined a script for if you're holding space for someone else doing it here's all the stuff to refer to so that you can have your cheat sheet off to the side so that if you get lost in the practice because well what often happens is uh there are certain internal moves that will max out your your cash like your ram your available working memory, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you will not, you will be very in confusion and, and disorientation and you're just like dealing with some sort of strong emotional reaction. And so in, the, in that moment, having someone else keeping track of where you are in the process and what, what next steps might be um, is extremely helpful. Um, and even when high levels of skill are developed, this can still happen. So I can usually scaffold it myself these days, but even I will hit, and this is after like hundreds of hours of doing it, I will still hit moments where I'm just like, I, what happened? Like I have amnesia. I don't like the, some, some parts are like slipping and sliding and like, uh, something strange is going on. And so having someone else, someone else in that moment is helpful. Um, it's still helpful to do it on yourself, but, um, but one-on-one -on -one is, uh, we are social creatures and one-on-ones, uh, touch more of the brain and it's a lot easier to stick to a commitment to, to do it on a weekly basis if you're doing it with another person. And larger groups also are not as good as one-on-one -on -one because with larger groups, each individual person can say, well, the group's gonna continue without me or I didn't do my homework this week or blah, 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 blah. One-on-one, -on -one, if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. And so, you know, you can do it with a, with a person who is, uh, you found a similar level of commitment to doing it and you know, both of you really wanna show up for the other person and, and do the thing. Beautiful. What, what, was, yeah, what is your mm -hmm. own? Yeah, please. Um, my own experience with core transformation. Is that, mm -hmm. is that sort of the, the thing? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so core transformation, I would almost call it a, for me, it was a, it's a, after having investigated like 12 different therapy systems, something like that, I really felt like it was the most, it like really cut straight through the most of any of them. Uh, there's another, there's another Vajrayana practice called, uh, uh, what is it called? In, in the West, it's called feeding of demons. I don't remember the name of it. It's like a very short word. Um, I think it's Chod. That one's pretty good. Might be wrong. Chod, Chod, yeah, Chod practice, yeah. Uh, but out of, yeah, out of all of them, 
that one cuts pretty deep too. But uh, out of all of them, core transformation seemed to be most directly, and especially for integration as part of the rest of your contemplative practice, because the core states that you are learning to trace your way to within the machinery of the mind, um, those are meditation objects. Those can be taken as meditation objects. And as far as I can tell, they seem to be the realm of Aharas. She has, she has five, so it's the former of Aharas plus another one. Let's see, what's the last one? Oh, Unity, mm -hmm. um, which is not explicitly one of the realm of Aharas, um, but, you know, Ekagata, right? One pointedness of mind. Um, it's complicated, that's, that's another rabbit hole. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll say the other the other four seem to correspond to Brahma Viharas. And taking the Brahma Viharas as meditation object, well, we have a wonderful sutta where the Buddhas, the, the, the Brahma Viharas were known about before uh, Buddhist, the Buddha's time. It was like a yogic practice. So practitioners of other systems come to the Buddha at some point and ask him, like, are Brahma Viharas good? Like, what do you think of them? Like, do they comport with your system? Will they bring freedom? Um, and the Buddha says, uh, no, the Brahma Viharas will not bring final freedom. They will get you to third path, hmm. which is like, I, I, I feel like more emphasis should be on this because this is actually, super, there's not that many claims throughout all the suttas of like, hey, this particular practice will actually get you this such and such far. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not even familiar with any other direct claim, claims that are that direct. Um, she says, yeah, the Brahma Viharas will get you to the third path. Uh, and then if you do the three marks in the five skandhas, that'll take you all the way. Hmm. So like, great, we got the cheat sheet. Like, just <laughs> if you if you can, uh, just just do that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the twin people, uh, various schools have rediscovered that a significant fraction of people make much faster progress taking Brahma Viharas as concentration objects rather than the breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that checks out. Uh, I think that's a. I mean, I, it's sort of counterfactual to my own experience, but that's a big part of why. I, want to share metta and the Brahma Viharas is, uh, well, I started them maybe seven years into my practice and uh, and then it took like six months or so to get the hang of them. And I wish they'd been taught differently, but then like once I got the hang of it, it was like, oh, this is way better than uh, the other stuff. And, you know, then I, I have acquired a taste and a flavor and a skill for the, the other stuff. But um, I think starting with the breath and body scanning was just like far more painful than it uh needed to be at the time and the Brahma Viharas I think is it, you know it, it can be difficult for some people it seems like some people yeah that's also not the thing but I think for a lot of people it's a sort of smoother sweeter more pleasant entry into practice than uh why am I following the breath this is inhale exhale what's the point you know uh I like combining them right you mm -hmm. can actually treat the breath as a meta practice I don't know mm -hmm. if you did, I tried this one it's pretty good I've done uh, some, I've gotten pretty into Tonglen recently, which is more about compassion, of course, but um, can you say more about that, how you've done that with Metta? Well, it's sort of the, the breathing in um, and experiencing, experiencing the breath as sort of like the universe taking care of you mm -hmm. and not, and you can do lots of different ways, right? So you could, like, it should be, people should fine tune it to whatever feels resonant for them. Um, but there's something like, um, you have the opportunity to sit in practice, which is something like even most beings don't get the opportunity to. Um, even most humans. Um, but you can experience uh, that you're sitting here on this cushion breathing in and experiencing it sort of as all of the desire for you to succeed in your practice by all the people who have who've succeeded in the past and in the future throughout all time, you know, whatever flavor, because people like to do that sort of thing too. Making it very spacious is actually a, a useful. I think that's an intuition pump for that particular thing that throughout, throughout space helps you to fill up the volume, the volumetric mm. aspect of experience with the sensation and not just localize it to the sort of condensed um, sense of the physical body. Uh, so you can experience the breathing in as you're receiving all of that, all that benefit from all the beings who worked hard to, to realize it as well and pass it on to you. And then breathing out to all the beings who have yet to receive it. Um, mm. you know. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll have to try to lead a meta because uh, I do on Saturdays the the meta group on this, so that would be a lovely exercise to do at some point. Um, can you speak to your experience of the Brahma Viharas generally? Like, well, what what is practicing them <laughs> been like for you? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So I started off in 
the tradition that Buddhism collided with to create Vajrayana, uh, the uh, non-dual Shiva yoga. And within that system, becoming a tantrika means becoming a person who dances with the balance of energies of experience. And so being in any given situation, it's not necessarily about, oh, insight into suffering, uh, insight into craving or blah, 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 or whatever. It's more like noticing that any given situation is off because there's an imbalance of energies mm -hmm. and figuring out, can I shape myself to provide that energy or help balance that situation so that it flows more harmoniously? And this dovetails with my Buddhist practice really well because the Brahma Viharas occur to me like this that if so normally if i'm interacting with someone who doesn't really know a lot about practice hasn't practiced a lot hasn't done any energy body work doesn't have that sensitivity built up um i'll talk about things in more mundane terms right more psychological terms more analytic terms like we were talking about philosophical distinctions um but if someone does have energetic sensitivity then i'm liable to talk about well notice how you feel in your body about the situation um, are the Brahma Viharas present? Is mm -hmm. there one missing? Are you mm -hmm. able to feel compassion for this person? Are you able to feel compassion for yourself? Do you feel joy? Do you feel loving and kindness? Um, and it's it's usually a matter of, uh, well, maybe there's one that they feel more easily. And so they can lean in that direction and enhance that. And that feels good. It could be also that there's one that they just don't have any access to in this moment. And it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Let's investigate that. Can we can we maybe bring it up? Can we, can we maybe try to artificially fabricate a little bit and see if that does something interesting if it resonates with the system in some way? Mm -hmm. And that will often lead to, to insight or, or a feeling of feeding starving parts, kind of like feeding your demons. Because demons want the Brahma Vahara the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I like, I don't know. I think I like hearing you talk about that because um, I like some of the specific points you made, but just generally, it really seems to me that um, I notice when people really take to the Brahma Viharas that the way that they practice it and the way that they describe it has a really beautiful individuality and flavor to it that sort of inspires. It's like, it always feels like, oh, I'm getting to learn Metta all over again because this new person is practicing Metta in their own way. It's like, oh, I never considered that love could take that form or like look like that, or you could practice it that way. And it, it just, um, maybe this is true for other practices as well, but it, for me, it just really resonates to hear how different people talk about it. And I learned so much from hearing people describe their Brahma Vihara's practice. Like, oh, I could love that way. Wow, incredible. Yeah. And it, that's it, great. That's yeah. great. I'm totally going to steal that. <laughs> uh, what, what's new for you about that? Um, just as an explicit frame. Mm. Like, yeah. Um, it, and, it, and it generalizes quite a lot, right? So you've, maybe you've heard before the, uh, the thing of uh, uh, everyone, treat everyone as if they're God in drag. Mm. Right? Oh, yes. I saw that and, quote and recently it's a little from game. Ram Dass, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a little game of God going, uh, I bet you won't recognize me if I dress like this. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> and it's the same thing, right? So it's like, uh, I bet I bet you won't recognize love if it's like this. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, the metaphor I've used for it before that I uh, feel is really resonant is like, um, is like a sunset or a sunrise where uh, on the one hand, it's the same thing that you've always seen, but it's just, I mean, every time I see a sunset, it's like, oh, this is beautiful and fresh and new. And I've never seen this particular one before. And it has a beauty and uh, significance that I have not been in that moment before. And so, yes, it's still the sun rising and setting. And But uh, that moment is new and fresh and beautiful and the particular place that I am and how I feel. And so uh, there's something familiar about recognizing love in the way that people describe it yes it's still love it's still fundamentally this um you know and increasingly i find it really just helpful like pedagogically and conceptually although this has downsides as well but just to use the word love and be like yes you can talk about the brahma viharas and talk about them as flavors but i think that love is just that it's, it's such a broad spectrum of things and i find it helpful to use an extremely general word where it's just like love takes many forms and has many flavors and 
particular sweetnesses to each of them. And um, yeah, I, that kind of experience happens when I hear people talk about their experience of, of love because it's like, yes, this is the same thing. This is still love. This is still the Brahma Viharas. And yet the particular way that that manifests in that person's personality and their practice is highly individual and specific. And uh, each time it's like, oh, wow, a sunset love, you know, wow. Uh, it really feels like that. So anyway, thank you for sharing how you see that and uh, feel touched by that. Yeah. Yeah. It also occurs to me that that makes staleness a really interesting clue mm. because staleness would indicate that I'm attending to the symbol and not the thing because each arising and passing um, on its own nature always has freshness. Mm. Um, but symbols have staleness because they're rounded off, right? Mm. We round off many, many experiences into the same symbol. Mm. That is literally a question I've had on my mind the last few days that you just provided the answer to. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, it, it, you know, you were talking earlier about having, um, how, does, how did you put it? Like like taking an objection to meditation practice as, as the object and like, can you focus on that? And there's a particular objection that comes up for me in my own meta practice sometimes of like, well, if I just felt meta all the time, like maybe I'd be really happy, but wouldn't that be boring at a certain point? It's like, well, that what you said just now is sort of an answer to that. It's like, well, it would be boring if you just focused on your concept of it, but if you stay with the freshness of the love, then uh, it's it's not actually boring. It is not actually boring. It's delightful and sweet and uh, nourishing and, and continues to open up in delightful ways. So anyway, thank you for answering this question that I did not even ask you. <laughs> yes. Um, Yes, well, uh, I think that there are a few other questions that I had for you, but I think at this point it might be good to just pause and uh, see how this conversation has been for you. And uh, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or ask or share? Uh, yeah, so. This has been kicking around recently, so it's not fully crystallized yet. Mm. But that maybe is is good. Very welcome. Um, I've been thinking about. Well, I'll just jump into the deep end and see how it goes. Maybe it won't work. Um, morality as a low dimensional projection of virtue, mm. being able to express virtues, um, and virtue as a low dimensional projection of skill cultivation. Hmm. So it's like, well, where, where does virtue come from? And where does morality come from? And I feel like it is actually tied together with the West has personality view, right? And famously the first, the first major milestone in Theravada Buddhism is, is letting go of personality view. And what I mean by personality view is every psychological model in the West carries a tacit or explicit personality view. And the personality, the thing that they all have in common or generally have in common is that they are largely stable constructs or considered largely stable constructs or stability is considered the defining feature of a good model of personality. And you might be able to see how this is actually a problem <laughs> um, if, if, the point of psych psychological analysis is to cause change and you have pre-commitments in your model to stability. It's like, well, we're trying to, well, we're trying to, people are perturbed from their stable and good um, and healthy model. And we're trying to get people back to that. This sort of is not really a developmental view of psychology, right? It's, it's this idea that, that this, these things would be fixed. Um, And de facto, it is fixed for many people because they don't actually learn the learn which skills would would change those things, and and change is, is you know considered threatening or whatever. Uh, so the big five are famously like stable over a lifetime for the most part, with some some drifts with age. Uh, but my assertion is it doesn't have to be that way. It's just if they're stable for you, it means you haven't learned how to sort of move across these. Uh, dimensions of ways of being. Hmm. So 
another claim is something like virtue arises out of deep skill cultivation because as you as you move from amateur to professional to master mastery of a particular skill you become aware of deeper and deeper structures and those structures are fairly universal so so when you read about mastery in many different fields from many different masters uh you know especially late in their career they sort of all sort of start to sound the same they, they use the same sorts of language they are able to talk to each other and uh famously i think it was uh christopher alexander um who made it he made an explicit note of this when he was talking about it about the way that there was this convergence and many of the virtues are things that you develop in the course of mastery because mm. you're forced to right patience and and uh attention to detail and taste and um uh i can't i can't think of virtues off the top of my head maybe this is a maybe this is a uh <laughs> indictment of my own my own uh position um But yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? I think so. I'm hearing that uh, skill cultivation or maybe excellence in particular activities or skills is the primary thing. And then um, uh, virtue and morality are increasingly like low resolution versions of that thing. Is that right? Yeah, like our, our, our picture of what a virtuous person is comes to us from mm people who have mastered skills mm. like, well, this person is, uh, you know, makes these kinds of situations very wonderful. They're, they're very good at like solving interpersonal conflicts. It's like, oh, they're very virtuous. It's like, mm. what? No, they have a particular set of skills that they've built up over a long period of time. Mm. Mm. And there's a, if you have morality or virtue as your primary model, you'll keep trying to like retranslate back to that, that frame mm. of like, oh yes, but they have the underlying blah, blah, blah. And they, but they always had the taste for this. And they would, so the thing that led them to be leaning in that direction is like, no, I don't think so. Mm. Like we know from developmental psychology, they, they, they have people trace, follow children for many years and try to understand developmental psychology and the uh, activities and skills that you randomly happen to, to have a good outcome with uh, when you're very young. Um, and they know this because they, they tested it specifically after the hypothesis was generated. They tested it specifically with activities that have random outcomes where it's not actually related to the ch child's underlying propensity or skill. Uh, the child tends to double down on those skills and activities, hmm. right? And then over time, this tends to calcify into what we think of as personality. Hmm. I like this. I don't like that. I'm good at this. I'm not good at that. And that shapes what we do, who we, who we tend to inter interact with, um, and on and on. So if that's somewhat arbitrary, right, then that undermines personality view. This is just something that happens during, during the identity formation stage. Mm -hmm. It's kind of arbitrary and you can change it. Now, when you're a child, there's more plasticity, you have more time, it's more expected socially. And so it's not nearly so threatening, there's less fear. And so all of those conditions make you more able to try this, try that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's harder as an adult. It's harder mm -hmm. as an adult to get over the hump of the first hundred hours of something where mm -hmm. it's very awkward and feels bad mm -hmm. um, to then feel like you have enough skill with it that it is intrinsically fun. Mm. It's kind of like developing taste, you know? Uh, when you first taste, you know, the wine, you have no idea what the notes that they're talking about are. And then over time you, you develop your palate, right? You, mm. you train a sensitivity to certain distinctions and expertise in anything else is the same. You're training a particular set of sensitivities. Um, and so you can do that with skills that alter what you is normally thought of as immutable personality characteristics. Now, this is again, scary to people, especially if they come from within the obligation frame. If you are trying to self modify out of self hatred, then it is not good to give you more powerful tools hmm. because you will just hammer at yourself harder. Hmm. So there's an integration aspect to all of this, but I think there's something important here. Hmm. And just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying um, in the West, we have what you call personality view, where we believe that we are someone with a specific personality and that is not changeable and it's fixed and we just are that way. And that's erroneous. It's an illusion and contemplative practice and other things can help you see through that and help you make your personality 
more fluid. And it, it, am I understanding that component of what you're saying correctly? Yes. Um, so how, how does that relate to uh, the development of skill as you're talking about it? Uh, because it's particularly, so you might think that you're bad at emotionally relating to people, that mm -hmm. you've doubled down on an analytic uh abilities for years and years and years mm. uh but you know a or year vice versa. Of, yeah yeah or vice versa um yeah you've been traumatized that you're not good at such and such and so mm -hmm. that you shouldn't try you should leave it to others um but a year of regularly practicing with a friend mm. um you will be shocked at since since most people don't engage in deliberate practice of skills uh you can quickly reach at least a strong uh what most people would consider a pretty strong level of, of competence within mm -hmm. any, any given skill. Not expertise, you know, you're not gonna become an expert within a year, but uh, you, you will have, and especially from doing it explicitly, you will have skills that even people who are intuitively good at it might miss out on because they've always just done it intuitively and never, have never really tried to explicitly oh, train it. Interesting, interesting. Well, I'm not, um... This makes me think about two things. One is most recently with what you're just saying, I've noticed even over the last few days, a very interesting trend in my own life and development that I, I've just sort of noticed and it's been made clear to me. But like, I think I'm I, at this moment in time, I am not especially interested in excellence, um, which might be an interesting counterpoint to what you're saying, but like I am more interested currently in being competent at a large number of things and uh, that interest me and that I enjoy and seem beneficial for me and others. And I'm kind of interested in breadth rather than depth of like, I would like to be kind of good at having conversations and I would like to be kind of good at writing and kind of good at drawing. I'm like kind of good at drawing at this point. And uh, I've been doing that for about a year, as you say, it's like not great, absolutely not great. I'm like kind of good at it. And, um, you know, or I'd like to be kind of good at leading meditations or, uh, any number of things. There's lots of skills that I'm working on. And um, that's more interesting to me right now than like doubling down on one specific thing. Um, I feel that's more fulfilling for me and just seems to be more connected. So I, that, I, I don't, um, that makes me curious about how you're framing it because I'm, I'm not really interested in excellence in one particular thing or mastery or something right now in any case. Um, it also, I think I've had a similar insight to what you're talking about, but maybe from the other direction of like, I've framed, I found it helpful to frame morality and rules-based morality as something like training wheels where it's like, okay, don't kill. That's the first precept. Don't harm others, don't kill. That's a, that's a good rule. Like you should follow that rule. And yes, it's a training guideline and, um, but even if you, it seems to me, even if you ascended the sort of levels that you're talking about into, you know, virtue and then into excellence or mastery, like probably you still wouldn't kill people and probably you'd be better at not harming other people, even like you'd still try to follow the rule and still maybe even be better at it than the person that's just like literally minding following the rule. Um, and, and so I think the rules still have value or relevance or something like that but there, there's a difference between literal minded rule following and like intuitively checking the rules against your own system and your own situation which i think is maybe related to what you're talking about of of maybe virtue of like actually interacting in a complex way with the system and situation that you're actually in um which is better than i don't know I, I i use at least speaking from experience here i used to very literal minded like follow rules of like i will not do the bad thing and i will only do the good thing and if i am in gray area that's extremely uncomfortable and i must be a bad person uh it's like no no actual life is more complex and nuanced than that and if i and in fact there's a kind of suffering that i experience and can cause if i try to keep it black and white when it is in fact gray and respond uh in a literal minded way. So uh, that's been a painful but helpful le lesson to learn. And, um, but, I, but, but I think the rules are still relevant. Like one should still look to whether one is causing harm, for example, or to one's speech, for example, the fourth precept, like how speech is always gonna be a relevant domain of action. And uh, yeah, you have to transcend literal rules to follow, but you should still look at how you're speaking and investigate that. Um, so anyway, th those are kinds of things that come up for me hearing you talk about that. Yeah, a classic example is 
the Buddha says, uh, the concern that you might lead students astray is a concern that never, never goes away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even when you're a full, full Buddha, and it's a, it's a good, it's a, of course you'd want to have some concern. You'd want to think about that. Like, am I, am I, like, I don't know with 100%, I don't have omniscience. I don't know my students' experiences. I want to be thinking about uh, whether or not I'm giving them the best advice. Um, the thing you said about excellence made me think, well, I think most people's, so where we're coming to excellence from is from the context of a highly specialized uh, mm. complex society where we're picking out one in a million examples of excellence in order to hold up as our, as our paragons. Um, and so that's an external uh, quantification of expertise. And I think the way I would actually define expertise is when it stops being external mm. and you're following an internal sense, of, mm. you're following an internal sense of taste Hmm. to develop a particular sensitivity or activity to what seems like it'll feel internally like some sort of platonic ideal, right? Like swimming, like hmm. the, the, the swimmer, the swimmers who really attain world-class performance. And th this has been studied. The people who study deliberate practice um, interviewed a ton of people who performed at the world-class level in various uh, domains. And one of the things they called out, it was at some point they stopped competing with the other, other people for the most part The the, cause you know, you compete once a year or something, or like a few times a year, the rest of the time you're training like every day. Like, mm -hmm. so what's, what's happening in training? There's, they're attending to some internal representation of sort of the platonic form of swimming mm -hmm. or like, and, and the sensitivity towards extremely micro uh, experiences of inefficiencies or drag or, or uh, just inefficient movement or some, something like that, right? In the case of swimming. Um, that's that becomes the guiding the guiding sense hmm. um and then whether or not you actually beat the world record or whatever is like well you do you don't like it's not it's not up to you hmm. that's so interesting uh yeah i think that resonates for me because i think mm, i don't know how to put this how to put this I, I haven't seen anyone do exactly the kind of thing that I'm hoping to do with my life. And in some ways, hearing you talk about this, it's like, I want my my own life as this Tashin person to be the canvas upon which I paint and the art form that I show to the world and express. And no one has lived my particular life before in the same way that no one else has lived anyone else's particular life before. And so there are various um, people that have inspired me or even heroes that I look up to, but, and something that I take away from their example or from their life or the things that they are expert in. And yet I do not want to be exactly them. I want to do this weird thing that I'm doing that's different related to, but different than anything I've seen elsewhere. And so uh, I think that's kind of how I hold my own life at this point. And that, that's why it would make sense to become like competent but perhaps mediocre or not excellent at a wide variety of things rather than, oh, I'm just like, for example, I mean, I like Tai Chi right now. Like I could just focus on getting excellent at Tai Chi, but you know, that would be enjoyable, but that doesn't seem like the best use of my life at this time. And I wonder how you think about your own life and what that along this direction of, you know, whatever you call it, expertise, excellence, morality, virtue, like what does, it mean for you to live your life beautifully at this point? Well, so if if cultivation of anything can in theory lead to virtue, um, well then it's kind of arbitrary. It's like, what, what, on what basis should I choose which things to focus on? Hmm. Uh, and my tentative answer is the things that seem to be upstream of lots of other good things or compound a lot. Um, hmm. So, you know, obviously, we're both meditators because on some level we've decided, oh yeah, yeah, meditation seems to be one of the meta skills that then enables everything else. Um, so things in this direction of sort of going upstream hmm. uh, of the things we actually care about and figuring out what are the, what are the real components of it? And I'm, I'm just describing expertise in a different way, right? Hmm. So I'm breaking, breaking down, okay, this is this life thing that I'm doing. What do I want to, <laughs> what tastes am I going to cultivate that allow hmm. me to uh, attend to particular sensitivities in my life that, that start to make some sort of interesting shape, interesting thing that I can do with other people. That's really, that's really uh, uh, nice. And suffering reduction is one of them, um, mm. but not the only one necessarily.
That's interesting. I, I very much resonate with part of what you're saying and then part of it doesn't really, I think in particular, the bit about it being arbitrary seems off to me because mm -hmm. I think um, like abstractly on paper, yes. But then in particular, it's like, no, there, there, for example, in this, in this conversation, there are two people with actual lives that are, you know, an actual, uh, maybe I just have personality view, but uh, 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 I don't know, like particular strengths and background and uh, experiences and so on. And for me, I really try to look at what is delightful for me and enjoyable and fun. And that sort of informs me of what I like to focus on. And, and, and also that's one variable. And then the other is what seems to be a benefit to others. So, you know, one way I could put that is like, what's beneficial for me and what's beneficial for others and try to maximize those two axes and um, kind of steer towards the thing that is both of them. And uh, I wonder, yeah, it makes me want, like what, uh, this is just another way of asking the same question I asked you previously, but what, what is particular to Romeo that feels not arbitrary that you want to focus on at this point in your life? Uh, well, one way I think about it is what do other people find boring or unpleasant mm. that doesn't bother me? And so if you abstract that heuristic, then yeah, that's, that's how you imagine a healthy tribe operating, right? So different people wind up with different proclivities, whether or not it's arbitrary or not, they just do in fact have different proclivities. So you would ideally want to be apportioning things that have various side effects in such a way that they are apportioned to people who are particularly good at handling those side effects. Hmm. So that all the side effects, the, 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 the sum total of all of the negative impact of all the side effects is minimized across the entire group. Hmm. So what kinds of things do you find enjoyable that other people find boring or difficult or challenging? Research review, um, Meditation, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at least the early stages when it's when it hasn't really taken off, it's it's boring or, or something. Mm -hmm. Boredom becomes a significant object that is worked with. Um, but yeah, research review and uh, uh, cognitive um, cognitive endurance for certain sorts of philosophical work reasoning that I find entertaining. That for other people, it just would be a slog. Mm -hmm. I feel like an obligation or something that they're doing because, well, I guess it's the thing to do. Um, or statusful or something, right? Like, it's just, yeah, if you can drop that stuff, uh, then, yeah. Also focusing on neglected, things that are neglected by others, right? Mm. So again, it's, it comes back to comparative advantage, right? So my assertion is something like, um, it sounds very economic, but what people find is that finding an, an unexploited niche feels intrinsically motivating, even though it's some, some part of it is tied up in the rewards you're receiving from the environment. But it feels we have circuitry related to, oh, there's a, a thing that's not being done that would be of large benefit to myself and potentially others if it was done. So why wouldn't I gravitate towards that? And then you, it feels somewhat intrinsically motivating to develop the skills for that particular niche. Hmm. That brings me back to a question I hope to ask that uh, I didn't really feel like there was an opportune moment for this, but uh, I guess I'm interested in your background with research because in some ways, um, you know, I've done like quite a bit of reading and uh, there's some like analytical thinking skills I think I'm quite good at, but it seems to me that the particular kinds of research that you've done historically are not uh, things I've done much of and maybe, maybe even don't have a disposition for. Um, and I'm curious, yeah, but it seems useful to like be able to be competent in them again. And I wonder what advice you would give people about like starting to research questions that they're interested in. Like how to do that research well or what things might not be obvious about how to do research well. Yeah, I'll say it's a very big topic because mm -hmm. it's sort of like the question of how do we know it's true? Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, epistemics and stuff. Um, I will concretely say that one of the large considerations uh, that frames the whole the whole thing for me, at least, is that's a lot of hedging. Is you aren't going to do everything yourself, hmm. right? Research even is just a process of figuring out what other people have said, right, about something. So knowing that. One of the most important skills is expert judgment. Who should I be listening to? 
how do I determine if someone says makes a claim, how can I figure out uh, how serious I should take that claim? And the more specialized a society you live in, the more this is true because everything's being done by some specialized expert somewhere. How do I get access to them? How do I evaluate their claims? How do I incorporate their claims into my own uh, beliefs and actions? And people have studied expert judgment, uh, fortunately. What can I say about it briefly? You'll learn certain tells over time of people who are uh, experts and people who are faking because there's a lot of there's a lot of incentive to fake in our society so a lot of people present themselves as experts uh, and that involves things like the expert is making very fine distinctions in lots of ways they're they are in tight feedback loop with reality they're making good predictions uh, they other other experts respect them even if they disagree uh, all sorts of like little heuristics like this um, that will sort of be a weighted sum it'll sort of add up to oh i trust this person because they, lots of the signals seem to be good and that's just a matter of picking up those signals over time mm -hmm. um and brainstorming more of those signals is like a great use of time mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then in particular uh there's at least one surprising claim about expert judgment that i should probably that i'd like to mention um When they were researching experts, they went through a process of trying to extract what the experts were saying and turn it into a model. And the interesting, interesting thing was, in many cases, they discovered that the model that they extracted would go on to outperform the expert mm. because the expert, and this isn't always true, it depends on the domain, but the expert would make a lot of exceptions to their own rules. Um, but these exceptions would on net decrease the decision quality. So, and the hypothesis for why this is, is that there's a pretty strong incentive when you're an expert to appeal to a lot of fuzzy uh, exceptions to rules because it, it uh, supports your position as the expert that you needs to be attended to, right? If, if it's just a model, then like they can just take the model and leave and then they don't actually need you. Um, you know, they needed you to generate the model in the first place, which, which our society is actually bad at, at sort of uh, crediting that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so there's dynamics like this of, of perverse incentives and principal agent problems that if you are alert to will help you with understanding how much and how far to trust uh, any particular expert judgment, hmm. which might be relevant for people right now since we seem to be living through a, uh, a period of uh, a substantial shift in people's sort of Overton window of how much they are trusting experts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you describe a, uh, a specific example in your research, whether it was about nutrition or longevity or, you know, Dharma practice or anything where you were like encountering these kinds of problems and had to work through them? Yeah, I'll give a very juicy example, at least for me, Ooh. maybe it's dry for other people. Uh -huh. Okay, so the FDA wanted to update its daily recommended intakes of things. And one of the things I wanted to update was salt uh, recommendations. And so, <laughs> because, you know, there's this whole thing of, there's this hypothesis that reducing salt intake will lower blood pressure. For some people, it seems to. Um, and it's been a whole thing for many years. This is a research question. Uh, but the FDA decided that they wanted to write the bottom line first. And they didn't tell the Institute of Medicine to uh, review the research. They told them to find the research that tells us that 1500 milligrams a day would be good. <laughs> and uh, wow. the reason that I know about this is that some snarky, some, some pissed off person at the Institute of Medicine who was like, this is not proper practice, wrote in the introduction to the review, um, the research review. Uh, and by the way, the FDA told us to do the research this way, which is like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, they, you know, they didn't say it like that, but like essentially the, the tone uh -huh. was like, uh -huh. um, we were unable language. to establish, yeah, they, they were unable to establish that. And, and so they wound up saying, um, uh, the level of, you know, 2300 milligrams a day seems to be well supported, but we have not been able to establish that less than that is actually, actually, uh, results in lower mortality. Um, and an example of the sort of, of the sort of underlying thing is something like, 
Uh, yes, so it decreases people's blood pressure, or at least some, some percentage of the population decreases their blood pressure. It also causes a substantial number of people to become lightheaded and fall, and the overall mortality effect is not clear, um, especially because uh, if you are the actual doctor in, in, in any given situation, you should be able to know whether or not the person in question is one of the responders to it because you should be monitoring. So there shouldn't just be a blanket recommendation. There should be, the doctor should be working with the person and actually figuring out what's, what's correct for them. Um, so then later editions of this, uh, it was updated several years later and this passage was removed from the new, <laughs> the new version of the introduction. Huh. Um, so, you know, who knows what was going on behind the scenes, but the kind of thing, I, it's the first time, this is the most egregious example, but it's not the first time. Big I salt was, was at work. Yeah, it was, uh, well, the opposite, right? Like the uh, low salt regime. Low, low salt, I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, huh. So yeah, it's, it's Kuhnian in a sense, right? That, that a position will become sort of the de facto standard. And then it, the, the burden of proof is shifted around by social reality, not by evidence, hmm. which, which side is going to be asked to make. Uh, extraordinary levels of evidence to prove that their side is true hmm. against the default. Hmm. Interesting. And, and 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 what was what sort of shook out for you when you were doing research about basalt? Like, how was that relevant to your own studies? Uh, yeah. So we we found um, basically under two grams a day. I can't say it with like higher resolution than that. Um, under two grams a day seemed to be associated with higher mortality overall. Uh, it's complicated. Some people are sensitive to salt and should pay attention to that, um, especially as they get older. Hmm. Um, but most people shouldn't worry about it too much. There's a confounder with processed food, where if you're eating a lot of processed food, it tends to be higher in salt because salt is an excellent preservative. Hmm. And it tends to uh, increase the satiety of food, right? So it makes the food tastier. So they add lots of salt to things. Um, if you are eating a diet of mostly whole foods, uh, you will actually need to add salt to your diet um, because a diet of, of mostly whole foods just doesn't include that much sodium. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. Huh. Well, I appreciate you answering that because, uh, yeah, um, lots of lots of questions about the world, and I think, yeah, I mean, you, I, what you're talking about, like getting better at skills of, that are sort of upstream, like yeah, meditation is probably one of the most general ones that I found, but I think like researching questions that you're interested in in a variety of ways is definitely like pretty, pretty uh, large effects from that. So I appreciate you lending your expertise to describing how to do research well. It's good to have concrete research questions because they keep you in touch with, with the world. They give you mm. a calibration, whether or not mm. you're losing touch with things. Mm. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I'm sure there's many things we could cover, but uh, that might be enough uh, brain filling <laughs> Wonderful. For, one, for one thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for speaking with me. I very much enjoyed this conversation and appreciate you sharing your time to speak with me. Thank you. Thank you for setting all this up. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.